Now at nine, Joplin police released the identity of a suspect wanted for shooting a man on Main Street. Plus a dispute in Joplin over the removal of signs opposing the city's capital improvement sales tax renewal and just like districts around the nation, schools in our area are dealing with teacher shortages. I'm Anthony Saviello, and I'll be speaking to a few school districts about what they're doing to retain teachers. The four states most watched news starts now. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Tanya Bach. Joplin police released the identity of the suspect in Monday's shooting on Main Street. That suspect is 33 year old Trent Cobb of Joplin. Police say he should be considered armed and dangerous. He is wanted for charges of first degree assault and armed criminal action. Those charges stem from Monday night's shooting of a man at 1817 South Main. Police say Cobb shot a man in the abdomen, and though we don't know the victim's current condition. Joplin police have released the identity of a teen who died in a crash on April 1st. This crash happened near the intersection of 32nd Street and Prigmore Avenue. Authorities say a pickup driven by 19 year old Cody Shaver was headed east on 32nd when it hit a traffic light pole and caught fire. Shaver was pronounced dead at the scene. Well, Chief Meteorologist Duck Eddie joining us now with a first look at weather. Well, not a bad Wednesday for us today, but it was definitely chilly. Temperatures for highs only 55, well shy of 66. That's where we should be topping out for this time of the year. 40 was our low and we're going to go lower than that as we get into the overnight hours tonight. We're sitting mainly into the upper 40s. Of course, we're dry. 45 Monette, 46 in Stockton, Pittsburgh, 48, 53 at Grand Lake. Parsons sitting at 46 degrees. Still kind of a northwesterly wind starting to calm down a little bit, uh, but a little bit on the breezy side, but we have clear skies. We'll stick with the clear skies. As we go through the overnight hours tonight, we do have some showers out across eastern Missouri, but that's the closest to us. 44 by 1135 by 7 a.m. Overnight low of 34 back to 47 by 10 a.m. Tomorrow we're going to look at next round of storms, clips weather here in just a bit. Thanks, Doug. Well, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment rescinds a stream advisory for Shoal Creek from the Missouri state line to the confluence with the Spring River and south to the Oklahoma state line in Cherokee County. KDHE issued the advisory yesterday as a result of a raw sewage release near Joplin. Sewer maintenance staff determined a pressure main was leaking in McLuhan Park. City staff are continuing the cleanup process and monitoring the repair. KDHE has deemed the stream safe for secondary contact, like wading and livestock use. Well, Joplin sales tax proposal is settled by voters, but an issue surrounding the campaign is not. Joplin voters yesterday gave their overwhelming support to the capital improvement sales tax renewal. But some citizens who oppose the tax are upset about what they see as an effort to silence their message. KOM's Amber Jenkins has more. During Tuesday night's council meeting, Brian Evans claims his signs opposing the capital improvement sales tax were obscured and removed by the chairman of the sales tax committee, Ben Levins. In a written statement, Evans says, quote, I had 90% of the signs that I put out, almost two dozen signs removed and stolen, as well as my signs blocked in and obstructed as to ensure that voters will only see vote yes on properties that we have permission from the landowners. Some other citizens supported Evans' claim. I've seen the pictures of the signs. They have the yes sign and then Brian will put a no sign beside it. He doesn't encroach on theirs. But he puts his sign beside it and they put more yes signs and sandwiches in so nobody can see his signs. Brian Evans has a video of Evans telling the committee to remove his signs. Uh, there's a gentleman named Brian Evans. He has a name on his signs. And if you see those signs, our signs are all, by, we've gotten permission from every one of our signs to put them up so we put them up. After listening to the video, Levins admits he removed three signs from private property. I did tell all of my committee members that they can take down signs if they put up signs on your property or somebody that you know is their private property and they don't have permission to have those signs there, you can remove those signs. Levin says after learning one property owner had allowed a sign, Levin's returned all three signs back to Evans. On Joseph's property, we had to leave him alone because they did indeed have permission. Uh, we did check afterwards and Richard Joseph uh, doesn't care who put signs on his property, so that's fine. And we, we left those up 
uh, as far as I know. Brian Evans has filed a police report on the matter. Reporting in Joplin, Amber Jenkins, KOM News. Joplin police confirm they are looking into the case. Well, two of our local elections ended in ties yesterday. Those were for the offices of Alderman of Ward 1 in Carterville, Missouri, and a board spot for the village of Milford. In both instances, the candidates will have a say on how the tie gets broken. Options include, used in the past include a special election or even a coin toss. Most area schools are just a month away from wrapping up the school year, and now a lot of administrators are struggling with how to retain and hire new and qualified teachers. KOM's Anthony Saviello has more. Yeah, I think right now um, it's a big time where you start to see a lot of teacher movement. As the 2023-2024 school year comes to a close, schools in our area are taking steps to retain the teachers they have and attract new ones. We're lucky a little bit. We've, you know, I, I, we've had a couple positions here at the middle school, and we've been able to to fill those positions, and we've had uh, we've had a, a good amount of applicants for those positions. Jonathan Wingert is the principal at Webb City Middle School. He says a big part of his job is supporting the teachers he has. I want to take care of our teachers because the better that I can take care of them or we as an administration can take care of our teachers, then the better our teachers can take care of our students. When it comes to teacher shortage, Principal Wingert says there's not much of one here in Webb City. However, other school districts in our area, like McDonald County, are switching to four-day school week to hopefully retain teachers and bring in qualified ones. The same can be said for Baxter Springs. Their school district is on the verge of wrapping up its first year of four-day school weeks. As far as recruiting for teachers, which is what we're doing this for, um, you know, we've had we've got openings um, and we've had several applicants. Though Superintendent Pendergraft is confident four day school weeks will play a part in retention, he says it's still something they will continue to review. We like what we see so far, but obviously we'll we'll evaluate this on an annual um, um, time frame. Um, but but again, we like what we see, but at the same time, we want to make sure we we thoroughly investigate this each year. When it comes to retaining teachers, solutions seem to be varied, whether it's a shorter school week, higher salaries, or just simply checking in on your teachers. All of them could be solutions. But now the question is, how do we get more teachers in the schools? Reporting in Baxter Springs, Anthony Saviello, KOAM News. Webb City Middle School held a hiring fair this afternoon to help recruit teachers and other school staff positions. Both districts say they also rely on word of mouth as a big recruitment tool. Fort Scott High School hosted a career fair today. The fair more than had more than 100 booths. The event introduces high school students to career opportunities in the region and prepares students for the educational requirements. The kids to see how awesome our community is and the businesses that run it and the needs that we have in our community for job openings. Um, you know, crash and burn. <laughs> yeah, just to have a successful day and have um, students become more aware. The event provided breakfast and lunch for the students as well as a drawing for prizes. PSU Today celebrates the school's long history. The Apple Day event celebrates the school's first president, as well as funding for the school's first permanent building, Russ Hall, back in 1903. Event organizers hope to cultivate a real love for the tradition surrounding the event. In order for tradition to continue to exist at your institution or in any culture, it really has to have a tie to people's hearts. And for our students, there just really wasn't as much of a tie. So the hope is that by reinviting the community to come out and be part of it and to have things that maybe, I don't know, are more fun, apply to a person's heart a little bit more, we can reinvigorate that tradition. And this is the longest running celebration in Pitt State history. Well, coming up, what to expect for this year's tick season and how you can protect yourself. Alcohol use disorder has heavily impacted men in the past, but recent data from the CDC shows deaths from excessive drinking are now climbing faster among women. Deaths from excessive alcohol use among women jumped during the first part of the pandemic up 34% from just four years earlier. Health experts say many people do not take the issue seriously. 
there are a lot of us that are functional alcoholics, mm. both men and women, where it doesn't seem like there's a problem until you hit that point where there's a problem. Uh, in terms of physical symptoms, nothing may be obvious again until you've really done damage to your heart, your liver. Uh, it could be very subtle, like just an increase in your blood pressure, which you may not even realize is due mm. to the alcohol. In addition to increased risk of high blood pressure, stroke, and liver disease, alcohol can also weaken a person's immune system and lead to cancer, injuries, and violence. Well, they are mistakenly thought to be insects, but ticks are actually arachnids, and they can transmit dangerous diseases to humans. That's why you want to avoid getting bitten. But these creatures are already out earlier than usual. Mandy Gaither has more on what to expect for the 2024 tick season and how to stay protected. In the U.S., tick season usually peaks between May and July and then again in the fall. But it's April and the creatures are already out. They are hungry, so they are looking for their first meal of the year, and they do pose that risk of transmitting infection. Dr. Bobby Pritt with Mayo Clinic says you can help prevent tick bites. Check your body often, especially after being outdoors. Wear long sleeves and pants and tuck those pants into socks, giving ticks less skin they can bite. And make sure to wear bug spray. Usually we look for tick repellents that have at least 30% DEET, but there are other chemicals, picaridin, that are, is a very good repellent. If you do get bitten, Pritt says to not panic. Remove the tick as quickly as possible. The best way to do that is with tweezers that you can use close to the skin, as close as possible, grasp the head of the tick as it's going into the skin and just pull it out in a slow, continuous motion taking care to not squeeze the tick or breaking off the mouth parts if you can help it. Pritt says if you live in an area where Lyme disease is present and find a swollen tick attached to your skin, consider seeing a doctor, especially if it's been attached for 36 hours or more. Your doctor can prescribe antibiotics to prevent Lyme disease. And be aware of the symptoms of Lyme disease, including fever, body aches and pains, upset stomach, severe headache and fatigue. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Well, Doug is next with a complete look at the forecast and later why the NEO baseball team is getting the opportunity to play in Tulsa in the same stadium of the Los Angeles Dodgers double A affiliate. Well, of course, uh, it turned out to be a chilly day and a windy day for us today, but overall not too bad across the region. And we have pretty much clear skies for us right now. Still a little bit breezy, but a nice shot. It's our Cornell Arts and Entertainment Complex. Tower Cam downtown Joplin looking off toward the north and to the east. All right, so our next storm system is going to roll in late Saturday. Slow warming trend ahead of it, but here's our hot spot for strong to severe thunderstorms uh, developing central Kansas down through Oklahoma late in the day on Saturday and then pushing east as we go into Saturday night. As of right now, it looks like the main threat is going to be hail, large hail and high winds across the region. Of course, we're going to watch this as we go through the next couple days. And then right after that, we have our eclipse. So we do have a couple big events that are going to be popping up. All right, so Saturday looks fine. We go into lower 70s. Thunderstorms develop. Central Kansas drive east during the evening hours. Pass through as we go into early Sunday morning and then gone by the time we head into Sunday afternoon. Sunday overall looks pretty good. Let's go into Monday. Of course, Monday is the eclipse day. Stopping at 1.30 roughly when uh, we're seeing the eclipse in our region. But I want you to notice where totality is a whole bunch of clouds. Hopefully this trend clears up a little bit. We're still five days away, but if you want to go into totality, we may have an issue here. It does look like back in our neck of the woods, partly cloudy skies. All right, temperatures right now, it's 46 in Stockton, Neosho, it's 53 in Miami, 46 in Lamar, much of the same in Parsons. Chanute is sitting at 50 degrees. We can go outside, currently 47. Still, we have a west northwesterly wind kicking in at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. These are going to continue to diminish a bit as we go through the overnight hours for us tonight, but pretty much clear skies. Not a whole bunch is going on for us. We're still watching this big upper level low rotating away from us as we go through the next couple days 
Here's a nice little ridge, a high pressure. You can see a bump in the upper level winds. That is going to rotate in, and what that will do for us is give us a nice little warming trend as we go through the next few days. All right, for you tonight, cold, patchy frost, 33, 34 degrees. By the noon hour, lower 50s. Once we get into the afternoon, near 60, still below average for this time of the year. Tomorrow night, 33, 34 degrees once again. And then as we get into Friday afternoon, better as we go into the mid 60s for highs. Day planner four, your Thursday, 35 in the morning, 53 by noon. Plenty of sunshine, high temp, 60 degrees, 66 Friday, 74 Saturday. That chance for evening thunderstorms. Sunday, mild and windy. We hang out near 70. Rain chances Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Okay. Um, well, I'm looking forward to the warmer temperatures again yeah. this weekend. It'll Overall, be nice. Not too bad. Got a little chilly there, but. Yes, it is. That looks perfect. Good job, Doug. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> well, coming up, the cost of buying a home. In 22 states, you'll need a six-figure salary to afford a median-priced home. I'm Jerry Willis with Fox Business. Coming up, we'll break down soaring housing costs under this administration. The Biden administration is backing off on refilling America's emergency oil stockpile. The Energy Department says the administration will no longer buy up to 3 million barrels of crude oil for a reserve site in Louisiana. The department says the shift comes amid rising prices at the gas pump. According to AAA, the national average has climbed by 20 cents over the past month to $3.55. Well, more hurdles for home buyers. Soaring home prices and mortgage rates are keeping many prospective buyers out of the market. Fox Business correspondent Jerry Willis has details. It's harder than ever for prospective homeowners to buy a house. A new bank rate study shows that the required salary to purchase the average home is now over 110000 That's up 46% in just four years. Home buyers only needed to make $76,000 back in 2020. And the issue is widespread. You now need a six-figure salary to buy the average home in 23 states, including the District of Columbia. Four years ago, that number was six. Mortgage rates have played a small role in the bump, but home prices have, by and large, kept pace with the needed salary to buy them. The average home nationwide is up 42 percent, sitting at 412000 So where do you need to make the most to buy the average home? California tops the list. You need almost $200,000 to buy the average home there, followed by Hawaii, Washington, D.C., Massachusetts, and Washington State. The flip side, least expensive states start with Mississippi and includes Ohio, Arkansas, Indiana, and Kentucky. Now, even though the housing market may be pricing people out, people shouldn't be too quick to think renting is the solution. Since Biden took office, rents are up nearly 21 percent. In New York, Jerry Willis, Fox Business. Well, up next, why these beat up pages could sell for more than two million dollars is expected to garner more than two and a half million dollars at auction later this year. Crosby show in Codex will go under the hammer at Christie's Auction House in London on June 11th. Now, the Codex consists of 52 leaves or 104 pages, and it's said to have been written by a single scribe over a period of 40 years at a monastery in Upper Egypt. It's the earliest Christian liturgical book written on papyrus in the Coptic language, which replaced hieroglyphics in Egypt. And it likely dates back to sometime between the middle of the third and fourth centuries. That's amazing. 30 more minutes of news, weather and sports is coming your way. How a local nonprofit is helping students find the perfect dress for prom. Plus Pittsburgh High School culinary students receive recognition for their hard work. Four states, most watch news. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Tanya Bach. A four states nonprofit is helping high schoolers find their perfect prom dress free of charge. More than 40 dresses will be available for donation this weekend. KOAM's Fernanda Silva has more. If I didn't have a dress that I liked, I wouldn't go to prom. Yeah, I think having the 
best dress is like not the best dress but like the dress that you feel the most comfortable in is very important because that's when you feel your best. Galena High School seniors Natasha Dunn and Pacey Clifford know exactly how important a prom dress can be. So it's always fun to just be able to get glammed up, wear a pretty dress and go to prom and just, you know, feel like the prettiest girl in the world. <laughs> but they know. Not every student has the opportunity to go dress shopping. We have a lot of students who could use the help and um, are just the resource of finding a dress too. It's, it can be hard, a lot of traveling and driving around. Students from Galena and other area schools planning to attend Brown will have the opportunity of dress shopping free of charge. When kids are in high school, it's something that a lot many look forward to and, and many will always want to have that opportunity as something to look back on. The event is organized by Dream Center of the Four States. What I'm wearing is one of the dresses available for donation, but there are many other colors, models, and sizes that you can pick from. We are excited to be able to do those, as you give those away to people in the community that might need them for prom. They get nervous about not being able to find one, and so when they know that there are churches here in town or other organizations or here at the school that will have one for them, that that it just makes it a lot more easier and it's more accessible to them. Galena High School students also have their very own prom dress closet. There's a self-confidence booster. They like to get glammed up for prom. And so if that takes one thing off their plate during such a busy season, then it's definitely important. It's just easy for them to get one and it's free. So it's, you know, nice for them. In Galena, Fernanda Silva, KOEM News. Now the event is happening on Saturday in Galena. Other clothes will also be available for donation. For more information, just go to our website. Well, some middle school students got hands on healthcare learning today. Students from the Pittsburgh Community Middle School made the trip to the John Parlo Education Center as part of their intro to health careers class. The kids got to tour the Education Center and Community Health Center of Southeast Kansas, Pittsburgh North Clinic, and see an, an automage table demonstration. Well, especially for eighth grade, really, you know, grades below are fine as well, but they're getting ready to go into high school. They're thinking about which classes do I need to take moving into high school. And as they get into high school, they can start taking college courses. And if they're leaning towards healthcare, depending on which field, they may need to load more classes that are math and science related or um, the career classes that are out at Pittsburgh High School, for example. It may be something they consider going into their freshman year. Inspire Health Foundation hosted the event. The Pittsburgh High School Culinary Dragons have something new to brag about. The team just placed sixth place in a statewide competition in Wichita in their first year. The competition, ProStart, is hosted by the National Restaurant Association Education Foundation Program. Now, the program teaches restaurant hospitality management, not just culinary arts. The kids on the Dragons team give the credit of their success a good old-fashioned teamwork. Place for management is seventh place for the culinary program, and the students have to do it all. I have to sit back and give ideas, but I can't tell them. But I can teach them the techniques that they want to do. They design their menu. They design their food truck for management. They did the whole thing, a complete business plan for the food truck. Layout of the truck, everything. It was wonderful. The eight students on the team each won a $500 scholarship. That's awesome. Well, a bit later, how much money businesses in the path of totality of Monday's eclipse could break in. Well, of course, a chilly day for us today. Temperatures, uh, four highs, only could get into the mid 50s during the afternoon. It's kind of cold outside right now. We're dropping back. We're going to continue to drop back as we go through the overnight hours. But here's a nice shot. This is of our Cornell Arts and Entertainment Complex Tower Cam, of course, downtown Joplin. All right, next storm system moves in over the weekend. We're going to make a little bit of a hot spot, and this is going to be for strong to possibly severe thunderstorms, which are going to roll in Saturday evening and then into the overnight hours on Saturday night. It looks like right now the main threat is going to be large hail and also some gusty winds, but something we want to watch closely as we go through the next few days. Now ahead of it warms up into the 70s on Saturday, but you can see that line of thunderstorms driving east Saturday evening. So this is something we want to watch pushing into the region Saturday night and then pushing out by the time we get into Sunday morning. So that's something 
we definitely want to watch as we go into the weekend. Sunday looks pretty good. And then as we go into Monday, we're going to stop at 1.30. So the eclipse, and of course, around our neck of the woods, it looks like partly cloudy skies at this point in time. Hopefully, this storm system kind of backs down a little bit, moves in a little bit slower. But if you want to go to totality, you want to watch this because right now, it looks like all clouds across the region, which definitely would not be good. All right, temperatures outside sitting into the mid 40s, and it looks like we'll continue to slowly drop back. Looking outside, setting at 47, we have west northwesterly winds at about 5 to 10. It has been breezy today. The winds are going to calm down a bit as we go through the rest of the overnight hours. So kind of a northwest wind at about 5 to 15 miles per hour. Clear skies, not a whole bunch is going on here. Watching our upper level low, our last storm system rotate away from us. Here's a ridge of high pressure that's going to roll in. And as it does so, what that will do for us is uh, help us warm up a bit as we go through the next few days. All right, tonight's going to be cold, patchy frost, 33, 34 degrees. As we go through the morning hours tomorrow, we warm into the mid 50s. Most of us should top out near 60 during the afternoon. Tomorrow night, again, low to mid 30s, maybe a little bit of a patchy frost. And then as we go into Friday, Friday, a pretty good day. A few clouds stream in and we'll go into the mid 60s during the afternoon. Here's your day planner for your Thursday, 35 to start, 53 by noon, 4 p.m., 60 degrees, which, hey, we'll definitely take. And then we go up to 66 on Friday, 74 on Saturday. We hang out uh, really 70s. Uh, just next Wednesday, 64, but mainly 70s down the stretch. Yeah, I like that stretch of 70s. Not yep. too hot. You don't really you can deal without the AC at that temperature. That's nice. Yeah, it's pretty good. I'll take that. I like it. Well, coming up in sports, Missouri Southern men's basketball picks up a commit from a two time Allstate point guard. Plus, NEO baseball plays a rivalry game against Connor State in a minor league stadium. John Dales has those stories and more. NEO Baseball has a special opportunity tonight. The Golden Norsemen play in the inaugural A&M Classic rivalry game against Connor State in the home stadium of the Tulsa Drillers. In downtown Tulsa tonight at One Oak Fields, home of the AA affiliate of the Los Angeles Dodgers, NEO Baseball faces Connor State. Bottom of the first, Wally Diaz launches this to right field. Solo Skalnik has trouble out there. Ball drops down and a run comes in to score. Connor State leads one to nothing. Later in the game, NEO trailing two to nothing. Jackson Smith hits this sharply down the line to first. Diaz beats him to the bag, but a run scores. NEO gets on the board, they're down two to one. We go to the sixth. Wally Diaz again, two runners on, and he gives this ball a ride to deep right field. That ball's gone for a three-run homer. Connor State leads 10 to one into the seventh. Tommy Kaya drives this up the middle. A run comes in to score, but NEO trying to rally too little, too late. Connor State gets the win tonight, 12 to two. It was an outstanding crowd. Dr. Stafford, our president, is the one that really started getting this going, and he's done most of the work, and we have a lot of people behind the scenes that really worked hard to make this happen for us. You know, it's disappointing to get spread in, a, spread in a situation like this, and a little bit embarrassing, but I love my ball club, I love my guys, and I think that yeah, we keep on working hard. I mean, it's pretty awesome. Uh, being from Canada, we don't really have stuff like this, and just to come out and get a play on a field like this, pretty cool experience. And Missouri Southern men's basketball concluded its 2023-24 season just under a month ago after the Lions put together a 13-16 campaign in year two under head coach Sam McMahon. Now they look ahead to the future and receive a verbal commitment today. Cooper Francis announces on Twitter this morning he's committing to Missouri Southern men's basketball. He's a high school senior at Salisbury who took home third place in the Missouri Class 2 state tournament this year. Now here's some more info on the newest commit to the Lions. Francis received all state honors from the Missouri Basketball Coaches Association both his junior and senior years. He's a six foot four lefty guard and while leading Salisbury to a third place finish 
in the 2024 state tournament, Francis averaged 34 points per game. Now over to Major League Baseball Royals trying to get the series win in Baltimore. After a five hour rain delay, things getting started. Cole Reagans pitches a gem. He goes six and a third tonight for KC, striking out seven, and he allows just one hit, leaves the game in line for a win. Royals up two to nothing in the seventh. That's when Michael Garcia goes the other way. That's deep into the seats, gone for his third home run of the young season. It's three to nothing Royals. The score's three to one in the bottom of the eighth. That's when Adley Rutschman hits it down the line in the right field. Now good play gets him thrown out at second, but a run scores, so the damage is done. Lead cut to one, now to the bottom of the ninth. One run Royals lead, base is loaded, two out. James McCann lines this into left field. Two more runs come in to score. The Royals lose on a walk-off for the second time in the past three days. Growing for Monday's total solar eclipse with cities from Texas to Maine expected to host millions of tourists. Now those in the path of totality could see revenue eclipsing a billion dollars. Fox News correspondent Connor Hansen has details. Residents and businesses in 15 states have long been preparing for the onslaught of eclipse chasers packing towns in the path of totality. Absolutely the largest event that we've that we've seen in Fredericksburg. This is going to be great for our tourism. It'll be 20 years before the U.S. sees another solar eclipse and people are getting in on the celestial celebrations. But if you're heading to the zone of totality, expect big crowds and big price tags. Many communities are also going to see tourists unlike the numbers that they've ever seen before. Flight prices soaring nearly double. Some hotels going for up to 10 times the regular rate, and that's if you can get in. Vacancy at hotels is scarce. Airbnb seeing a 1,000% surge in demand for cities along the path of totality. Benny Aspara listed his property near Cleveland and it's been booked for months. A lot of the revenue that comes to local restaurants and local businesses come from those tourists, but also that income to the Airbnb homeowner stays in the community as well. Local business owners are cashing in, selling souvenirs, hosting special events like Eclipse wine tasting, and crafting themed treats from donuts to beer to commemorate the event. Some stores will shut down for the day. Others, like roughly 50 stores of regional grocery chain Wegmans, will close their doors for 30 minutes to give employees a chance to experience the eclipse. Many schools along the eclipse trajectory using it as a teaching moment, offering once-in-a-lifetime viewing for students, while some will be closed entirely. That includes Bell County, Texas, where the population of 400,000 is expected to double. They're joining multiple other communities issuing local disaster declarations. Officials in those areas urging residents to stock up on food and gas ahead of the rush. Whether or not there are enough restrooms, whether or not there are uh, restaurants or service stations uh, in order to service the tourists. And that can put a bit of a strain because both guests and locals are using the same resources. Everyone viewing the eclipse must have a pair of eclipse glasses. That's the one thing that won't set you back too much, starting around $2.50, but many are free. In New York, Connor Hansen, Fox News. Well, coming up, we'll check out some of the fun events Fox has set up outside the iHeart Music Radio Awards. Fox served up fun experiences for cooking show fans right before the iHeart Radio Music Awards with photo ops inspired by a couple of Gordon Ramsay's shows. It's where they caught up with a couple of MasterChef Junior contestants to hear all about their time on the show and their future goals in the food world. Here's Fox's Ashley Devorkin. Fox set up fun for foodies and photogs near the iHeart Radio Music Awards with an Instagrammable setup inspired by Gordon Ramsay's food stars and MasterChef Junior. Right Bree and Jason from MasterChef Junior were at the event and spoke about when they first learned they'd be on the show. I was like, whoa, I got picked? And like, I never knew I got picked on this famous 
cooking competition. I've always wanted to be on a big TV show like this where I can do what I love. I gotta flip my burger. Both dished on their favorite meal to cook. Burger, of course cheese and meat. I also use mushrooms and onions and I, and I cook those. Um, and my special sauce, my special secret sauce. For me, it's probably like my noodles because even though noodles are basic, right? It's really basic, but with me, since I'm the Spice King, I can make different spices and I love ingredients. So I turn it into different kind of ingredients and experiment the ingredients. While they left the competition, they shared their future plans in the food world. I'm just trying to keep on cooking and experimenting with different ingredients. I've read a cookbook with different spices. I'm I even invent a new ingredient. I want to soon open a food truck and it's going to be Breeze Burgers. I want to be known around the world. And so if I have a food truck, then I can just drive everywhere and then I can just stop if somebody wants my burgers. And I'd be your first customer. <laughs> <laughs> Master Chef Junior continues Monday nights on Fox. In Hollywood, Ashley Dvorkin, Fox News. And I'd be her second customer. And that's our time for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We're going to leave you with video of animals at the Milwaukee County Zoo during a light snowfall. Have a great night and an even better tomorrow.